Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that engages us this morning is the epistle from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you have ever driven through southern Louisiana, then there's a good chance that you have been on the gun bridge. At least that's what I called it as a kid, as I often tried to count the pairs of pistols that adorned the guardrails on either side as we crossed over into Lake Charles. Adults called it the I-10 Calcasieu River Bridge, and driving to its peak felt like you were on a roller coaster that was making its initial ascent. Since my childhood, my beloved gun bridge has been declared one of the most dangerous bridges in America. It came in at number seven, according to Travel and Leisure magazine back in 2013, as they cited the bridge's rusty and deteriorating bolts. You know, there are companies who have policies in place that forbid their employees from driving company assets over this bridge. Yes, there's a, another one, a newer one in Lake Charles, and that's the, that's the one they are supposed to use. Structural engineers have been perplexed as they have studied the bridge's supports, wondering how in the world is this thing still standing? You know, the church can often feel this way. People from the outside look at the things we say and do and wonder, can I trust the church to support me? Can I trust the church, church to support all of my baggage? People from inside the church can even have doubts about who the church can support. People we are close to in the community who we wouldn't want to invite to church because the church might drive them further from Christianity. You know, can I trust the church to love them with all of their struggles? Or will they simply be judged because they're not like the rest of us? Can I trust the church to love me? All of me, mess and all. I mean, this sounds crazy, doesn't it? And if there's one thing the church should know how to do, it's love, right? I mean, isn't love one of the most essential parts of being a Christian? What it means to follow Christ, who says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. If there were ever a group of people who were experts on love, it should be Christians, right? I mean, the world should be looking to us to learn what love looks like, yet the church is often the last place that people look for love. There are many adjectives used to describe the church today, and unfortunately, loving often doesn't make the list. Of course, we could dismiss this reality by pointing to the fact that many people are incapable of knowing what love is and that so much of the world has such a distorted view of love that they wouldn't recognize it when they see it. We aren't the problem. Everyone else is wrong. Or maybe, just maybe, one of the most challenging things you and I will ever do in our lives is love. Maybe love isn't as neatly defined as we often make it out to be. I mean, you know how we do that. We go back to the Greek, confidently talk about the different types of love. That, that eros is the 
romantic love. Philos is the love of friends, and then the agape love, the, the good kind of love, that God's love, that's the one that we really should be after. We need to go agape people. Or we talk about love languages. How if we learn a person's love languages, about gifts, quality time, physical touch, words of affirmation, and so forth, then we can clearly, more clearly communicate our love to them. You know, as one who personally values such ways of talking about love, I can attest to their value, but I certainly don't want to dismiss that. But there's a reason that Paul goes to such length to talk about love in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, we quickly become like that lawyer whose simple question about who his neighbor is sends Jesus into this parable of the Good Samaritan. If you remember that story, that lawyer presumed that he understood love and that he was doing it perfectly and that he just needed to know the boundaries of where he was to direct it. That was it. He was confident in his ability to love. How confidently do we present our capacity to love? our ability to love. How easily do we throw out those words, those phrases, hey, I love my wife, I love my kids, my church, I love my city. And we use this verb with the utmost confidence. We apply tough love, explaining to our kids or whoever else it might be that may not think this is loving and say they'll understand it one day. As the church, we insist that we love the sinner while hating the sin. We even back it up with our theology, confessing that true love is shown to us by Jesus who is willing to lay his life down for people who didn't deserve it. That we love because Christ first loved us. I mean, this all sounds great. And yet somehow so much of our talk about love has been devoid of actual love. As the body of Christ who has been given more gifts than she could ever imagine, all of which Paul goes and describes at great length in the previous chapter, the church has somehow missed something incredibly important in the midst of it all. None of those gifts matter. Nothing else matters without love. You know, love lessons are something that the church should never stop learning. They are lessons that will always challenge you and cause you to see the world around you differently. Lessons that will challenge how you are currently looking at a person or people in your life. You know, I once had a man in my office to whom I read this chapter, and his response when I finished was simply, wow, that was beautiful. He missed the point. I wasn't trying to bring his mind, to his mind fond memories of these sentiments being shared at weddings, many of which fail to mention from where this love actually comes. Now I'd asked him to come to my office that day because his actions of late were causing problems in the church and in his campaign to point out where everyone else was wrong, he couldn't see how his words, his emails, his actions had all been devoid of love. And no matter how right he thinks he was, he was wrong. I wasn't reading this chapter to soothe his ears, but praying that it would challenge his assumptions and change how he was relating to his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I was reading this chapter for my own good as I was struggling to love him in this situation. Love 
is hard. It's the most challenging thing you and I will ever do in our lives. And it's a lesson that we never stop learning. And in these words, as Paul shares them for us, as I read them to you now, we see a love that is perfect, a love that is amazing, a, a words and a lesson that shakes us and causes us to rethink things and reconsider things. But also we see a love that we can marvel at as we see it in our Lord. So I encourage you to, in your bulletins or in your Bibles, if you open up here to 1 Corinthians 13 and listen as Paul teaches us again this morning. He begins with what love isn't. The things that easily replace love because we've made them more important and we've had our sights set on them. Paul writes, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a no, no, noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And suddenly this is where Paul then points our eyes to the future to have us imagine life at the end. Life in the new creation. A time and place where we will love lavishly and unconditionally, when we will no longer struggle with who to love and how to love. When we will be fully who God created us to be as we live in his presence and in the fullness of his love. Paul says, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, the greatest of these is love. How is the church still standing? You are the body of Christ. You have been fully known by the one who lived and died for you the perfect one who has come and fashioned you to be like him. The one who not only embodied love, but is himself love. 
the one who broke down barriers by loving the unlovable, the one who built bridges to reach out into the communities to reach the unreachable, the one who did not insist on his own way but willingly took the way of the cross, the one who the world looked to on Easter morning and said, how are you still standing? This Jesus, who loves perfectly, has chosen to lavish his love upon the world through you. He loves you more than you can ever imagine in order that your love may know no bounds, no limits, that you may give the world a taste of what is to come, that we're not just left wondering and thinking, oh, this is what life will be like, but even here and now as Christ is living and at work in you, the world gets to taste it and see it now because the power of Christ is at work in you. That is who you are, washed in his baptism and fed at his supper. You are built for this kind of love. Rusty and deteriorating bolts and all. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.